are so thrilled in bringing our gifts to Him. And so folks, most of the time we are giving our gifts neither with joy nor with sacrificial offering in the plates. Most of the time it is, you know, we have to do it because we have to do it. Or we do it because it's a, a ritual. No, that's not the way to do it. One verse down from Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able, follow this through with me please, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Now, this is the end result of your giving. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always having all sufficiency in all things. Wow, this is wonderful. This is glorious. And many of you missed it. This is what you will get. This is what you will receive when you give with that kind of attitude. All sufficiency in all things. Do you experience all sufficiency in all things? Then you must change your attitude and, and how you give. The more we trust Him, the more He shows us that He is all-sufficient. The more we see that He is all-sufficient, the more pressure and worry is taken out of us. Because He is the all-sufficient one. And the less pressure, worry, and worry means a whole lot of more joy. You know when you know you earn X amount of money and you also know how much you have to pay, there's no joy. Then time goes by trying to make two ends meet, the joy is gone. But when you do as God's word exhorts you to do, you will have sufficient. The all sufficient one will make everything sufficient for you. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. That doesn't mean that God's going to give you a big Mercedes Benz and a mansion. But it does mean that He'll take away your financial worries and fill you with joy. That's what you've been striving for when you joyfully sacrifice. You are striving for joy. Just like the remnant, you are striving for joy with joyful sacrifice. Strive for joy with joyful sacrifice and joyful service. Look at verses 18 to 20. Strive for joy with joyful selves. Well, the remnant had just finished their massive building program. They didn't have enough people to do the work to begin with. So what did that mean? It meant that those that were there had to work doubly hard. And they didn't have enough resources to get the job completed. So what does that mean? Those that were there had to dig deeper into their pockets. But now the work is done. Now it's time to kick back and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Time to let somebody else take over the reins. Time to sit back and say, we've done everything. Others now need to go on with it. Even though they had worked so hard. Even though they had given so much. This was no time to sit back and take things easy. And I speak to you as our church and the church here. It is no time to take it easy, thinking that we have it all. Now's the time that we need to work even more harder. 
And they did it by continuing to serve. It was a different capacity, but it was all the same, very challenging. They moved from a building program to an ongoing operation. As soon as they laid down their hammers and chisels, they picked up the brooms and rakes and spades and they started to do other work. That's how it's going to be done. And we can see how God has blessed us over the years. We can see that He's given us one building after the other. And no sooner did we finish with the lecture theatre, it was time to work on the library. And now that the library is getting almost complete, it's time to work on something else. Amen. Why? Because we must go on building. Amen. We must not stop building. The next building project is going to be the biggest of all. Amen. Bigger than we've ever done. Putting all of this together, it won't compare to that one. Don't ask me where the money is coming from. It's not coming from overseas. It's coming from over there. Amen. It always comes from there. And nations and, 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 and people from all over the world will be coming here. Not like they are not coming already. But they will be coming in their bus loads and plane loads. There are two or three people that believe me. <laughs> the rest of you, skeptics and agnostics and lunatics, it's okay. <laughs> Strive for joy with joyful service. I've got good news for you. The church isn't here to serve you. The church is the body of believers that God had arranged. God had organized so that you should serve the church. You think the church is here to serve you. That's wrong. The church is not here to serve you. You must serve the church. Shake your heads with me if you agree. You are to serve the church. Because this is what God started. And he wants you to put your hearts and souls into it. And sacrifice and do everything. So that it could go on from strength to strength. You see for the remnant it was no easy task. As a matter of fact it was a very challenging task. But it was a matter of service to God and they did it. And how did they do it? They did it with joy. And that's how we need to serve the Lord. Serve Him with joy. Is that kind of joy easy? Is it easy to work 40 hours for your boss and then put up with more time serving in the church? Is it easy to spend all your waking hours Thinking about how you can improve the work of God. No, I can tell you it's not easy. But the Lord never called us to ease. He never said it's going to be easy. He never said you can sit back and relax. He didn't. I didn't see anywhere in scriptures where he sat down and said, Well, I think I did enough today. He was always going to another place, to another people, to serve them. And that's the God that we have. The God that I'm introduced to in the, in the book of Genesis is a God that worked. He worked for six days. And he didn't take any lunch breaks and tea breaks. And he didn't take any breaks at all until he finished his work. And my Bible tells me that when he finished his work, then, then he rested. 
But today we want to rest first. And then we want to work. And then we want rest in between as well. And you wonder why we can't accomplish anything at all. And we have lots of excuses why we should not work. But the God that we serve is a God of work. He created everything you see around you. He created it. He made it. And so, if He was a God of work, it means that we must work as well. Notice, the last time that anybody in our remnant was weeping was when they quit working. Do you want to be full of joy, folks? Then you've got to strive for it like the remnant did. Strive for joy with joyful service. Strive for joy with sacrifice with service. And also strive for joy with joyful separation. Look at verse 21, the first part of, uh, uh, and, and also the first part of 22. Strive for joy with joyful separation. What a blessing it was for the remnant to be a people again. What a blessing it was for the remnant to come back to their own country and to be together as a people. You remember that Nebuchadnezzar, he had a purpose in how he treated Judah when he conquered them. Years before, you remember, he conquered them in three major stages. First, he stole away the very best and brightest of people. For example, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He stole them away and took them completely away from their culture. He gave them Babylonian food, Babylonian uh, education. He gave them Babylonian names. And he thought he could completely brainwash them to be Babylonians as well. But these young men knew who they served. And none of those things could wash them away. None of those things can, can, could deter them and change their minds. Today it's very easy to change people. Give them money, give them food. And you know, the Muslims are doing it all over the world today. And we have millions of Muslims in Africa just because they were hungry and they didn't have food. But these members, these members of the remnant, they knew who their God was. And Nebuchadnezzar could give them the best food and the best education and the best names and the best indoctrination one could ever receive. But they did not change. He could not do it. In the second and third stages, he did similar things to the remaining Jews. And that was the whole reason for exiling them. The whole reason was to take them away from the things that made them unique as a people. Know that we are unique. We are unique as a people. Because our God is a God that hears us when we talk to Him. We have a relationship with Him. I can call Him my Father and know that I could be immediately transported to His throne room and I could have a personal consultation with Him. That makes us unique. He knows my name. My Bible tells me that my name is written on the palm of His hand. He doesn't forget me. He knows everything about me. And I can talk to Him. He knows me. I'm not a number. That makes us unique. Absolutely unique. And when I cry, my Bible tells me He's got a bottle and He saves the tears. What a God this is. What a wonderful God he is. And so, Nebuchadnezzar thought he could change these people. Give them his food. Give them his kind of education. But it didn't work. They were out of captivity. And could separate themselves from the pagan influences of Babylon. They were out of captivity. And now they could separate themselves from the filthiness of these heathens in these lands. As Christians, we too live in the world. A world that is corrupt. A world that is full of sin and evil and wickedness. Jesus acknowledged that as he said in his prayer to his disciples in 
in John chapter 17 and verse 16. He said, they are not of the world. We are not of this world. We can't think like this world. We can't talk like this world. We can't behave like the people in this world. And so Jesus went on to say, even as I am not of the world. But even though we are not of the world, we are in this world. Jesus doesn't call us to be monks and nuns. He doesn't call us to eliminate all contact that we have with society that we live in. But he does call us to do something else instead. He calls us to run from the world and the worldly influences, but run to the world with the good news of Jesus. That's the difference. That's what makes us different. That's what that verse really said. I pray that thou shouldn't take them out of the world. Don't take them out of the world. But that thou should keep them from the evil. God, don't take them out of the world. Keep them in it. Keep them in it. But keep them qualitatively different than the world. Keep them from being tainted by the world. That they would be separate. All too often we think that being separate from the world is by being dressed differently, having different kind of haircuts, but that's not what we call separation. Separation is about what the heart is all about. Separation is to know where you belong, what you should do, where you should be, how you should act, and how you should speak. And when we get hung up about this outward stuff, then we truly miss the point about separation. I, I heard about a certain man who felt that he wanted to be separate, and there was uh, quite a difficult situation he was living in. Everybody was cussing and swearing in his home. There was strife and division in his home. And so he got a chair and he put it on top of the table. And he said, I'm going to be different. I'm going to just stay on top here. And I don't care what happens at the bottom. <laughs> you can't do that. Jesus said, we must be in the world. We're going to be buffeted by the world. We're going to hear people cussing and swearing, and we won't cuss and swear. We're going to be hearing them saying all kinds of evil jokes and dirty jokes, and we won't laugh with those jokes. That's what it means to be separate. We're part of the system, but we don't become the system. And so separation from the world is separation unto Jesus. That's finally and ultimately. Our separation from the world is being separated to a person. We love him and we serve him. That's what we're really striving for. And that's what's joy. Strive for joy with joyful sacrifice. Joyful service. And joyful separation. Finally, strive for joy with joyful strength. Look at the last part of verse 22. Strive for joy with joyful strength. Did you notice that? Who was it that made them joyful? The Lord did. That's the running theme throughout our scripture. The desire and the courage to joyfully sacrifice came from the Lord himself. The strength and the perseverance is joyfully serving and it came only from the Lord. The determination and the willpower to joyfully separate from the world came from the Lord himself. And because of that, the joy 
came from the Lord. Trust me folks, it doesn't work any other way. If you sacrificially gave every penny you got, or not penny, every cent you got to the church, because I told you to do it, it would be a burden. Finally, you'll have no money, you'll curse me, you'll curse the church, and you'll leave the church. Because I told you to give. And you know, a lot of people say, give and you'll get this, and give, you'll get another house. No, don't hear anybody. Hear God. Giving, you must hear God. Everything you do, you must hear God. It would become a burden. You would not only be broke, you would be burdened instead of being blessed. You would be burdened and you will resent me and before long, we will see your back. That's all. You will be gone. It's the same thing with separation. If you do those things because I told you to, there is no joy in that. The joy comes from the Lord. Separate because this is what God is saying to you. Make a point today that you're going to have a line of demarcation with people that you should. Not because I'm telling you, but because God is telling you. Because if you follow what I'm telling you, then you'll get all your families against me. And you'll say, oh, the pastor said so. Oh, let's say we want to see this pastor. <laughs> and I, my life is going to be on the line. So please don't quote me. Okay? Please don't quote me. Quote Ezra. Quote the word. Because that's where I'm taking it from. If I say to you, come and serve in the church. We need a lot of people. We got a lot of work here. And then you come and you serve here because I told you. And then you go home and your wife gives you a hard time. Then you're going to turn it all over to me. Why? Because I told you to work. I don't want you to work. God wants you to work. Amen. God wants you to give your time. And when you come doing it because He is telling you to do it, then I don't have any problem at all with any wives when the husbands are here for too long. Or else can you imagine, my life is going to be ruined. They'll be cussing me all the time. And I have a lot of people cussing me already, so any more than that I won't be able to handle. <laughs> and so what I'm really saying is, in our service for God, it must be God telling you to do it. Because you know it's the right thing. We must serve Him. When Jesus saves, He now lives in you. His Spirit now lives in you. He gives you all you need to have so that your joy will be full and complete. So if that's the case, why do we have to live a life that is so unjoyous? Why do we have to live a life that is full of strife and full of pain? Is joy not the end result for serving Jesus? I can't think of a worse personal circumstance than when Jesus endured the suffering and shame of the cross. But do you remember what Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says? Listen to it. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, enjoyed the cross. The joy was set before him. But what did he endure? The cross. The cross was joy to Jesus. Because he had his eyes on his father. And so we can also honestly say this morning. That our circumstances can cause us to lose our joy. 
We lose our joy because we quench the spirits working in our life. But Jesus gives us joy. When we serve Him, we look to Him. We get our appreciation from Him. We get our blessings from Him. We get fulfillment in our labors because of Him. But if we're doing it for the church, and if we're doing it for the school, and if we're doing it for the pastor, and if we're doing it for anybody else, we lose our joy. It's a very temporal joy. But when we change our attitude and we tell ourselves, it doesn't matter if they mention my name or not. It doesn't matter if they know about this or not. I'm doing this for Jesus. How can you experience joy no matter what circumstances you're going through? Quit looking at the things God has called you to do as obligations. If you're doing anything as an act of obligation, quit and quit right away. See them as what they are. See them as the joy that is set before you. Sacrifice joyfully. Serve joyfully. Separate from whatever needs to be separated from joyfully. And when you do those things, the Lord will give you joyful strength to endure whatever is in store for you. And then you too can say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And this morning I want to say to you, whatever you're doing for Him, do it with joy. And the end results, I cannot even explain to you. I cannot even elaborate how blessed you will be. Now, don't be like the fellow who planted some seeds in his back garden and the very next morning he rushed over to see how big it is. Because it takes time. Alright? So, when you sow, remember that in God's divine timetable, he knows when that seed should produce fruit. Now you don't go out there and dig up and see what's going on. Many of you have lost out because you went before your time and dug up the seed to see, let's see, let's see what's happening. I put in this and they said I should receive. So they said, so, so bountifully, and you will reap up. Now, I'm waiting. Let me dig and see this. Don't dig. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. And in due season, you shall reap. But do it with joy. Do it with joy. I was at a morning service in Pretoria some years back. And they were celebrating the wedding of one of our students. And uh, in that culture, it was quite okay to have uh, this wedding ceremony in the morning service. And uh, I'd uh, preached and taken my place. Uh, and then everything was done in the language, so I didn't understand what was going on until I saw people bringing in wardrobes and stoves and microwaves and they were dancing into the church with all of this. Yes. Dancing in. Can you imagine having a microwave and you were dancing and bringing it in? A, a big double bed dancing in and bringing it in. And here it was placed all over the front. And then I discovered it was all the people from the congregation that was uh, bringing these gifts to this young couple. Both. Um, man and woman were students here and they were getting married and uh, they 
they took care of everything. Microwave, you double door fridge. And they danced in with it. <laughs> I was amazed. Normally when you give something so big, you feel, oh my God. But these people knew how to give. They gave the best. Father God gave his best. It wasn't easy. No father can stand by and give his only son. We have many fathers that have only sons here. And I believe nobody could even touch them. Nobody could even say a word. They will stand up in defense. But this father, he offered his son. It would have been easier. Now I looked at this hard and long. It would have been much easier for a father to have said, Don't worry, I'll die for the people. Because as a father, I know that I would rather take the punishment, that I would rather die than see my child suffer before my eyes. But this father gave his only begotten son and endured the pain, the agony of seeing his son suffer. At one point of the suffering, he couldn't, he couldn't see it. He turned his back. And it was at that moment Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For that moment, Jesus felt that separation. God gave his best because he loves you so much. And he gave it with joy. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to give your life to Jesus with joy. Not with some sort of grudge. Not because your father said you should. Not because the church wants it. Not because I want it, but because you want to do it. I want us to bow our heads in prayer. And I want to give you this opportunity this morning to offer yourselves as a gift with joy to God. Are you prepared to give yourself joyfully to whatever He wants you to do, in whatever capacity He wants to use you? I don't know where he wants you. I don't know what he wants you to do. But what I do believe that he's looking to you to fill that gap. Is there anybody here today that would like to say, Jesus, I want to give myself to you joyfully. Whatever you want to do with me, you can do Lord. I stand and offer myself to you. If you want to do that, do that right now. And we'll pray together. Joyful sacrifice. This is what it means. To joyfully sacrifice unto the Lord. Anybody else before we pray that wants to make a joyful sacrifice of their lives to Jesus? Do it now. Do it because you know God's called you spoken to you and he loves you he loves you Father God I thank you for these your dear children who stand in your presence this morning Father I thank you that they joyfully present themselves to you take them Lord and do as you will 
Take the Lord and empower them. Take the 